Domain Tools help security analysts turn threat data into threat intelligence. They take indicators from your network, including domains and IP addresses, and connect them with nearly every active domain on the internet. Those connections drive risk assessments, help profile attackers, guide online fraud investigations, and map cyber activity to attacker infrastructure. Fortune 1000 companies, global government agencies, and leading security solutions vendors use the Domain Tools platform as a critical ingredient in their threat investigations and proactive defenses. For more information, visit securityweekly.com forward slash domain tools. The greatest threat to businesses today isn't the outsider trying to get in. It's the people you trust, the ones who already have the keys, your employees, your contractors, and privileged users. 60% of online attacks are carried out by insiders. To stop these insider threats, you need to see what users are doing before an incident occurs. Observe it combats insider threats by detecting risk activity, investigating in minutes, effectively responding, and stopping data lost. Give it a test drive at observeit.com forward slash security weekly. Today's determined attackers easily bypass even the most advanced network defenses. Trying to ramp up staff to detect their back doors can cost thousands of dollars and take months, even years. With Active Countermeasures AI Hunter, we enable junior analysts to detect even the most advanced back doors in a matter of hours. Sign up for a demo and purchase our product today by visiting activecountermeasures.com forward slash ESW. Active Countermeasures. Make every analyst a hunter. Are you looking for high-performance data storage that's easy to use yet secure enough for the Department of Defense? Look no further. Racktop Systems gives business software-defined data storage complete with embedded compliance, security, and data encryption. Don't let cyber threats, regulatory demands, or the complexity and growth of your data overwhelm your business. Racktop's high-performance data management platform gives you the tools you need to address the most demanding data challenges. Think beyond storage. To learn more, visit racktopsystems.com. And welcome back to Enterprise Security Weekly, episode 107. It's time for the news. All right, Doug's still with me. I am. But I'm going to run this segment a little bit. He is. Kind of balance. Yeah, I think you're still around, right? Oh, I, yeah, good. I, you're still in the studio. I'm there. No. I didn't sneak off while you were, All right, while you were away. Let's start with our... You didn't. Yeah, I <laughs> didn't take the machete with you. Oh, yeah. All right, so let's start with our first news story. Cisco aims to make security foundational throughout its business. Um, you know, it's been interesting to watch Cisco grow over the past few years, you know, as the networks kind of moved around into the cloud, you know, the question was survivability of Cisco. They've made a lot of investments on the security side uh, when they bought um, uh, source fire yep. and uh, made other investments, but they've changed up the business unit a bit, um, you know, really have a, a strong business unit now on security focus across network and endpoint. They've done some very interesting stuff with Duo security and the acquisition of Duo, really starting to expand that security portfolio, which I think is really interesting um, for them as, as, as a business. I, I completely agree. I, I'm glad to see Cisco doing that. I mean, they, they've been there. I mean, I've been working with Cisco since long ago. I was working on PIX firewalls and things like that. And and the Cisco presence in a lot of organizations is, is just sort of, you know, everywhere because you have all your, your hardware and your layer one stuff and your layer two stuff is all sitting there and it all says Cisco on it. So it's good to see them embedding a sort of, I don't know, uh, gestalt, I'll use that word, a gestalt approach to uh, security, which is the way security should be. It should be all through your organization, not just something you bolt onto the top of things. So it's good to see Cisco putting that kind of stuff together. Yeah, and, and they're moving away from the traditional network security, they are. right? They've got endpoint solutions yep. now. They're doing stuff in the identity side. They have a strong services practice. So it's not just about the network anymore for them, which right. I think is something that was needed. They needed to to really think about how to expand out um, beyond the network, and they've done that. Uh, that's a smart business move. I, I mean, that's you've already got everything that's labeled Cisco. Why not start putting all the other pieces in there as well? And, and I mean, if somebody wants to become a one-stop shop for security, I mean, it may never happen completely, but somebody wants to be that once. Just like, you know, just like in the old days where you could go, you knew you could call IBM and say, I need... Uh, you know, a computer system. And IBM said, we'll send out the engineers and we'll hang all the wire and we'll do everything. And I think that's kind of where somebody wants to go with that space to make it, you know, just wire us up, guys. And if, if Cisco can say, I got all your hardware, now I'm going to put all the pieces on top of that, I don't see why you wouldn't turn to your main vendor for networking stuff. Not, I mean, and, and so if they can get there, then that, that would be a very powerful position to be in business-wise. 
Agreed. I like it. All right. Next article. Fidelis Cybersecurity announced a new $25 million round to expand its cybersecurity platform. Um, and so I, I, I've known Fidelis for a little while, and a number of folks from um, Tenable went over to Fidelis. Um, looked like they were growing pretty well. They kind of slowed down there a little bit. And, you know, they made a, a change in the CEO back in April. They brought over uh, the original, uh, I believe, founder from NetWitness, the company that uh, Meet ultimately um, took into EMC RSA, came over uh, to run Fidelis, went out, raised some money, and it looks like they're going to continue to to expand out their security platform. You know, when I re- when I dig into the story a little bit, it, it it's kind of a me too story a little bit. Um, you know, you think about existing SIM platforms and some of the other security platforms that are out there. So they're, they're competing in a pretty crowded space, but yeah. they are also building managed services on top of this platform. So they have a managed detection response capability, uh, managed security services. So it looks like it's a combination of product and services where um, that might differentiate them a little differently in this space compared to others that are just primarily selling more of a product, um, but another funding round uh, for Fidelis. No, I mean, and it's like I was saying about Cisco. I mean, I think everybody's chasing this sort of uh, the unicorn of an all-encompassing solution because that's that is really what people want is the ability to call that one eight hundred whatever and say, "I need you fix it," and somebody who can come in with with the whole not just here's a product. Why don't you try it? But rather here here's our solution. And again, I'll go back to the old IBM days. You could count on that. I mean, you could call IBM and they send a bunch of engineers and they designed it and they fixed it and they put it in place and you sit down and turn it on. And I think that's sort of where people are chasing the security space uh, is how do I get to that, you know, just big solution. And, and that sounds like what Fidelis is trying to do as well. I mean, maybe not hardware level, but that doesn't matter so much. I, I mean, I think if you can provide that big solution, you're going to be a, a winner in the long run. Yeah, and the people to go with it. I think the big challenge oh, now yeah. for most organizations is do they have the people, the resources to deploy and manage these systems? If I can get your software and services with it, I'm better. That I mean, that was that was the big problem way back when with the main, with the computing world in general. Was between that and the distributed people, it was the same thing. It was how do I get good people? The minute I get them and I train them up, then they get hired by the clients or they get hired by my competition to build other products. And it's really tough to keep a, a top-notch service staff sitting there ready. And, and that's what you got to have to win that game because you've got to be – if you're going to be the one-stop solution, you got to be the one-stop solution. You can't be the, oh, yeah, but, our, you know, we care about you. We care about you. You know, and, I mean, if you're doing that, you're not going to stay in that game very long. So I, I think that you have to get the people, you have to keep them, you have to develop them, and you have to keep – being the number one or you end up you know number something else yeah number something else (laughs) all right let's go over to ca technologies research explores artificial intelligence to help improve iot uh this is an interesting announcement in that um ca is is getting some research dollars and some funding here to really start to look at how artificial intelligence can help with the internet of things. You know, a lot of companies talk about artificial intelligence and their solutions, but very few actually have it. Here, I think it's interesting because they're gonna start research around what artificial intelligence would look like and how could it be used in understanding behavior and other things around in um, IoT and industrial IoT. Um, you know, I. Up until the Broadcom acquisition, I was I was pretty um, interested in what CA was doing from a security portfolio perspective. You know, I'm a big believer in user data and application security. CA was building out a really good platform with the Vericode acquisition, had a bunch of identity um, assets already in the portfolio. And in, I, I kind of knew where they were going from a security perspective. I hope that continues under Broadcom after the acquisition. This, though, is going to put some dollars into some artificial intelligence research. Let's see what pans out. They're not saying that they have AI-based um, solutions yet, which is good. Uh, just kind of doing <laughs> the research for it. I, I I both love and hate hearing this because I, I love artificial intelligence, but I'm scared to death of it. 
I love IoT, but I'm scared to death of it because, you know, I, I don't want to get chased off somebody's property by a, a swarm of angry drones that, that has, you know, perceived me as a threat. I, I see that happening, but I, I am glad to see somebody focusing on this because we, we do hear a lot about AI and, and AI is one of those buzzwords that, that marketing came up with and said, you know, we ought to, we ought to be an AI company. And then everybody wanted to have AI in their thermostats and AI and their, you know, microwave ovens or whatever. But the reality of it is, is that drones and, and IOT devices, which are so voluminous, really do become a perfect model for artificial intelligence and artificially intelligent systems because managing 144 little drones that are swarming around you to protect you from harm or whatever those drones are monitoring your medical state or whatever is going to be an AI problem, which means there's going to be AI security problems, which means that we really do need people starting to focus research on how does AI interact with IoT? How do we defend IoT from security threats that are also being generated by other systems and other IoT? So my drone swarm can stomp your drone swarm, and I'll meet you down in the parking lot at dawn, and we'll see whose drone swarm comes out on top. Your smartest, so it'll probably be yours. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I'm laziest, so my mine has to. I'll still be asleep early in the morning. Did we miss that? Yeah, was that today? Uh, next one is SecureWorks announces cybersecurity maturity model. I thought we already had one of these <laughs> called the cybersecurity framework. But they don't have one. Um, <laughs> you know, I love when people, you know, companies make these announcements. We've got this new maturity model. But it uses the NIST cybersecurity framework as the basis. Right. Look, the cybersecurity framework is a really good starting point. If you want to understand the maturity of your cybersecurity program, go look at the cybersecurity framework yep. and measure yourself against the requirements under each of the five domains. And you don't need somebody else to tell you how mature you are or not because it's all right there for free. Um, sorry, but that's just a simple way to think about it. Um, so this announcement, I wasn't that interested in, okay, they're going to try to measure uh, maturity for their customers and you can get a free evaluation. Like I said, just go to cybersecurity framework and do it yourself, rate yourself one to five, total it up and call yourself good. I, really, it, I, I think you could do it yourself. It's the second announcement from SecureWorks that I thought was more interesting. And that is the partnership with CrowdStrike. Yes, absolutely. Um, and this is uh, interesting because I know a little bit um, of some of the stuff that SecureWorks has been doing with the endpoint side of the house, right? They were a strong partnership with Carbon Black early on. They built their own kind of behavior analytics product called Red Cloak. Now what they're doing is expanding the partnership with Red Cloak, their behavior analytics on the endpoint with CrowdStrike and then CrowdStrike's uh, endpoint product. And that's really interesting to me is, you know, there's certain things that the MSSPs are trying to build above and beyond use it, leveraging their own customer data, leveraging external threat data to drive uh, a better managed service. Then they tie that with really good industry leading products like CrowdStrike. And that only enhances, I think, the service that they're offering out to their customers. So this was a more interesting SecureWorks announcement this week than the maturity model one. Well, I, th I think the maturity model one is really, yeah, I agree with you 100% on that. But I, I will say, I think that's just them saying, here's our, you know, here's how what we're going to use, you know, as we go forward. And again, it's this gestalt, we're going to be your solution provider. So we've got this product and that product, and we go all the way from this end to that end and everything in the middle. And here's our model we're going to use to base it. But yeah, I mean, it's like, you can certainly go do that yourself. I mean, you can decide where you are in the cybersecurity process. And I recommend you do that before you contact a vendor because then you're not relying on someone else's sales exec to tell you where you are. You can at least have some basis for where you think you are. I would do that assessment of my organization before I started contacting these vendors. Not that them doing it again isn't going to be a problem, but it's really interesting to see where you fall and then what they where they tell you you fall. And that way you it's just like it's just like doing research if you're going to buy a car or anything else. I mean, you have to know where you are and what you can afford and what you're going to buy and what you're looking for. And then you can go out and start shopping because now you're an educated consumer and you can go to this company and say, "I like what you're offering." you tell me where I stand. And when they come back and say, oh, well, you know, they don't agree with you, then you can you can at least argue from a point of knowledge, maybe. That's just something like that. Take a machete. It's, it's helpful. 
that will get you through those those difficult negotiations. No comments on the CrowdStrike piece. <laughs> Uh, oh no! I mean, I was I was actually yeah. The CrowdStrike piece is, is about uh, again them blowing this up into an end to end solution so that they can say we have everything from Red Cloak, which is more of this sort of threat analytics kind of stuff in the back end, to CrowdStrike's endpoint threat intelligence stuff that's coming in. I I really think it's again it's the same move we're seeing from Cisco. It's the same move we were talking about. There's sort of a theme here, and the th and the theme is if you can create this big thing that's got that I call the one number. We care. We've got the best people. We can solve your problem from end to end. That I mean I think that's why they're merging with these different people. That that's a sort of mat maturation of the industry is seeing these these pieces all start to kind of bubble together to form a bigger bubble. And hopefully that bigger bubble can encompass us all. Yes, let's hope so. <laughs> all right. These next couple articles, we might um, ruffle a few feathers with Ooh. our um, ICS community, but I, I, <laughs> I, I can't ignore these. Uh, so the first one is Force Point brings full weight of defense grade cybersecurity portfolio to secure industrial control systems and critical infrastructure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We so we had we did a segment at Black Hat uh, when we were actually a, a summary of Black Hat at DEF CON on the ICS market, and we talked about how the problems are different. And here we see another example of a traditional IT security vendor trying to take their existing IT security products yep. and port them over into industrial control systems. <laughs> and buyer beware, they're different. Um, uh, look, I like the force point portfolio from an IT security perspective. Don't get me wrong. They're next-gen firewall. They have mm -hmm. the data security component. Um, they have this whole human-centric kind of approach, which is good. But some of those technologies do not translate into the ICS world and the SCADA world. I'm sorry. They just don't. The protocols are different. The things you're looking at are different. And so this, I've seen this from a couple of the IT vendors really trying to move into the industrial control SCADA environments with their legacy portfolio. And I'm just telling you, it's not a one-for-one -one match. This is not the same thing. I, um, so I'm a little cautionary here when, when, when I see some of these announcements, because I know that they're going to try to apply the same old stuff to a wholly different set of problems. Yeah. Well, my middle name is caveat emptor. So to just, just to get that out there, but, um, <laughs> sorry, Latin jokes never go over well. Uh, the, the audience is not laughing, but I, I completely agree with you. SCADA is one of those terrifying things, uh, and I, our ICS uh, is one of those terrifying things to me because it was it was all designed in an engineering world, which was which is the old world. So the old world was like take engineers, design things to solve a problem. So I need my lights to come on. I need my thermostats to be adjusted and monitored. I need these machines to turn on and run and spin or whatever they do. And I need these valves to open. And in the engineering world, that means you design a motor, an actuator, you design a system that monitors the actuator and the actuator trigger, you monitor the pressure on the lines and all these things. And engineers do a very good job of that. The problem was no one ever thought about these things from a bigger perspective of security. We see the same thing. We talk about chip uh, compromises and all kinds of things. And as you see people trying to bolt on commercial solutions to ICS, I foresee a great deal of difficulty in doing that. It sounds like it's doable because we think in terms of I'll put uh, an antivirus system on this laptop. Okay, fine, that, that works. But the problem is when this is a custom laptop that was built by me with an engineering solution in mind that was put out there 22 years ago with no thought of, of the internet, no thought of the cloud, no thought of any of these things. Am I ruffling your feathers yet? Um, all those things come sort of come home to roost, speaking of feathers. And, and now you say, I'm going to take a solution and I'm going to bolt it on this and it's going to work and it's going to be great and all your problems will be solved. And I get really nervous about that because all of us have done work with auditing and, and work with analyzing and solving problems in ICS, at least I have. And every time we faced one of those challenges, whether it was an audit, whether it was in trying to solve a networking problem or it was trying to bolt an ICS system onto the internet, it was a nightmare. 
and you went in and it was talking to an engineer about an engineer about an engineer who died 22 years ago who built the system and the engineer is going well we think that'll work and and it just i i completely agree with you i i think let the buyer beware here and and you know i sometimes these kind of solutions become pr more problematic than the solution they were trying to be or something like that yeah right you bet <laughs> so the second article and um, in the same space it's from Indigy talking about the top five risks in OT and how they're the same as IT. And, and look, some of these are, don't get me wrong, but how you solve them is different, which I think Indigy does a better job of trying to talk about here on this particular piece. Yeah. Um, so the, the top five, poor network configuration. Yes. Mm -hmm. Check. No doubt about it. <laughs> um, look, I worked in nuclear power for seven and a half years. I would have never connected my systems to the rest of the network. Really bad We idea. didn't. <laughs> they were isolated. We did that on purpose. I would never connect them. Now I know why people connect them because they want to try to update them on all this other stuff and give them access. Yep. But poor network configuration, yes, it exists in this space. That um, that and engineers telling you things like, well, it uses port 232 and, uh, you know, and it's sent uh, over Telnet and, uh, and and that that facilitates. But because it uses port 232 on Telnet, uh, nobody will ever figure that out. I mean, I had somebody tell me that once, and I was like, they won't figure what out. And he was like, that it's using port 232. See, Telnet runs on a different port than that. And I'm like, okay. okay. And, and yeah, and then when they, if they, fortunately, that wasn't somebody telling me. And then that, that's what triggers all the nuclear weapons because, you know, you just send, a, you send three X's in a row over port 232, and they all launch, baby. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, no one's heard of a port scanner, right? Okay. <laughs> not not um, those guys. Risk number two, no audit trail. This is kind of true. I mean, if you think about these systems, they don't have a lot of uh, logging capability, especially when you're dealing with relays and, and yeah. PLCs and the different controllers. The management servers typically do, um, but are you collecting those logs? So, okay, valid. But again, you're not going to use your traditional SIM to do this. Nope. Uh, Number three was lack of control. Yes. And, and one of the examples in here I thought was just, I, th I think it's, a, it's kind of funny. It's not funny, but it is to me a little bit. Patches can't be easily deployed and usually aren't. Yes, there's a reason for that because yeah. patches can break the system, right? <laughs> just because Microsoft has a vulnerability in its operating system um, doesn't mean you have to that, that you should necessarily patch some of these systems. They, they're different. And this is what I've been trying to say in, in a couple of the segments that we've as we've been talking through this. These systems have a level of delicacy with them, and, and they're there to drive safety concerns. And so you're not going to put these on a normal patching sequence and just auto-update patches. You really have to think about what's the impact of patching these devices, does it break the rest of the systems and bring down the plant? That's and, the concern. And a lot here. of the systems are so big that, I mean, they're so huge. There's so many pieces and so many moving parts that when you do patch it, it's impossible to simulate the test. I, I mean, I, I worked in a nuclear facility as well. And, and I mean, I can remember these huge books of all these things that happened when a certain process was triggered. And, you know, they're going to, you know, we would, we were writing software for some of this stuff and, you know, just me running a script is like, I have to trigger 5,000 things and, and like, what's going to happen if I patch that and what's the, I mean, oh, that's, yeah, that's very frightening. Uh, number four is employee ignorance. Well, how about uh, that? Look, from an IT security perspective, we don't understand these systems. We don't understand how they work um, really well. The plant managers do, the plant folks do. So yes, there is a little bit of that. That's why I said communication is very important when we start thinking about IT and OT security. We need the IT guys understanding what the operational technology control system guys need, what can be done, what can't be done. That's a dialogue. That's an education back and forth. Definitely needs to happen. Uh, the last one here was insider attacks. Um, okay. I'm not, I guess I'm not as worried about insider attacks necessarily you know if 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 we've got poor network configuration and we have nation states trying to bring down our power grid yeah. i'd be a little more worried about outside attacks and insider attacks I, I guess if you're disgruntled or something like that there is a concern there that's why i like these networks isolated yeah um, i like them understood better i i don't like them connected to the general network population but you know that. That's, but but I will that's say me. that that in in where you worked at the nuclear plant, where I worked at the nuclear plant, I those the people working there were very vetted, 
you know, so the, all the people that worked for, for us were, had top secret clearances. They had all kinds of, you know, capabilities. They had been fully vetted through many, many processes. And that doesn't mean they can't become disgruntled and they can't get crazy. But, but my concern about insider attacks comes when we start actually realizing what critical infrastructure actually means. And it's not just nuclear weapons, that it's also the water supply and the gas mains and the power and the stoplights and the traffic cameras and all these things we depend on every day. And maybe a lot of those employees aren't quite so vetted as the people that were at that facility. So I, I, I definitely will, will, I will at least support the insider attack item uh, in the sense that I think that is, it is a big threat. And, and they are a threat because they know the systems as well. So they know all of its weaknesses and they know all of its strengths. And they know that if I go close valve X, it causes a giant disaster. And I didn't get that pay raise, so I'm heading down there right at, right now after work. So, But, but okay. Good enough. <laughs> all right. Next one. Crossmatch announces availability of digital Persona version 3.0. Yay. Um, and, and so this is your multi-factor authentication um, solution that added uh, face biometrics um, and some other capabilities, hard tokens, and, and some other things here. Uh, look, I, I, I see a lot of uh, continual innovation here. One statement in here concerned me a little bit. You know, according to Crossmatch, Digital Persona is the only multi-factor authentication solution that allows contextual slash risk-based authentication for Windows login. I'm pretty sure there's other multi-factor authentication solutions that are also doing context contextual and risk-based authentication. Uh, I think it's a little bold claim, but uh, they claim it nonetheless. Um, but this is, you know, this is one of those things we're going to continue to see with, with multi-factor authentication, adding in biometrics and other factors to use is, is part of those um, solutions. I, I, I agree, and, and I, I do think that maybe that statement, they qualified it with Windows logon, so maybe it's some specific aspect of Windows. I, I don't know. I, I agree that's a kind of a bold statement that we're the only multi-factor that can do that. I personally welcome multi-factor authentication in any form because we need it so badly, and we're never going to solve the problems of identity theft and all these things until we have some kind of multi-factor. Obviously, a lot of people are terrified of this stuff because they feel like it violates their personal privacy that their data is being collected, that they're headed toward, uh, oh, now I'm not going to think of what's, what's the, uh, the Ethan Hawke movie um, where you know, everybody has to put a drop of blood in the little reader every time they go to work, every, everything they do, they have to get their DNA checked for validity. Eh, I can't remember the name of it. I'm sorry. I'll think, I'll think of it. I don't a, watch movies. I don't have time. I'll think of it. As, <laughs> oh, well, oh, I, I, okay, I'm out. That's just like, um, yeah, I didn't watch it. No, I didn't. I didn't have time either. I don't, no way I watched that movie. No, I just I read a summary of it on, on online. But but I mean, uh, I think that those things are going to be some sort of solution to our problem. Uh, I actually put the the other article in about this uh, about the the video AI stuff though. But and, and the reason I put that in there was because one of the things we're seeing now is artificial intelligence and this other article that, that I stuck in there and I'm going to, I'm going to look real quick to tell you exactly the title of, of what I put in a uh, video fingerprinting was, was me, me ranting about, yeah, but uh, what we're seeing is that artificial intelligence of some sort, I haven't looked at the code, so I don't know exactly what it's doing is able to take not only the, the voice of someone who's speaking, but they can take the, the facial, movements of that person and impose them on another so they were taking uh the example i saw was they took obama and they put his speech onto vladimir putin's face and and not only was was putin saying the words that obama was saying his face was actually reacting in similar ways to what obama was doing and then they also did that onto ronald reagan or somebody and and you know they were just showing you how this this ai could just very quickly take this and the reason I stuck that in there because with that was because I started thinking about, well, if multi-factor relies on all these facial components, will AI be able to then to, to emulate this? And, and that was going to create a huge problem if, if it just suddenly invalidates all multi-factor authentication because, you know, an AI can duplicate your thumbprint with some kind of little nano thing on your thumb. Uh, okay, well, you just beat the fingerprint thing. If it can beat the face biometrics with that or, or whatever, all of a sudden it's like, wow, a whole new world. 
And then, of course, I immediately started thinking about how do we hash and, and verify and what kind of authentication do we put into video so that you will know it's me talking and it, it wasn't Matt or it wasn't Paul or, you know, now I can do the show and they just, this AI just blows it onto Paul's face and, and, and you think it was Paul and maybe we're doing that already. I don't know. I could, if it, Paul's doing me, I, I, I'm not sure. I don't think you'd make that mistake, but... But the idea of it was very frightening to me. How do we validate someone who is a talking head telling us things and we say, well, this is coming from the president or this is coming from Doug or it's coming from whomever it's coming from without some kind of hashing, some kind of you know, multi-factor authentication just on things we're getting, not just to validate us, but to also to non-repudiate uh, what someone's telling us. And that was kind of turned into a rant for me because I was like, how do we do this? Are we going to hash this stuff so that I can I put a digital signature on it? We're going to have to do something or it's going to be a problem. So I, I kind of went on this wild train of thought from that one one article. Which is why I let you explain it because <laughs> I, I, I couldn't yeah, understand get the reasoning initially. So that's okay. Well, see, that's right, how last, I got there. La last article we're going to cover today, Iodium commands 13.6 million in a series B. Now, some people may not have heard of Iodium. I know this because of General Electric and GE Ventures and some of the work that I've been doing at Layered Insight. Uh, this is a GE Ventures uh, company. Uh, as uh, some people know, GE Digital has been, you know, pretty forward thinking when it comes to the digital transformation of industrial IoT. And Iodium is a solution. Uh, I, I, I'm going to call this an edge solution. Um, the way they describe themselves is a little more complex. It's this software-defined converged infrastructure for industrial IoT. But what that really means is, as we think about the digitiz digitization of these sensors and plants in airplanes, in all these industrial environments, there's a reemergence of edge computing, but in a very different way than we're used to edge computing. We're not talking about server farms or anything crazy. We're talking about serverless infrastructure. We're talking about containerized applications. And Iodium is one of those vendors that plays in this kind of serverless edge computing space to bring some of these edge solutions to life. Uh, so they got another round of funding, uh, $13.6 in a Series B, which is good for them to continue um, expansion in the space. It's an area I like to watch because it's going to change the way we think about security in the future and, and this concept of, well, how do you protect serverless environments when there's no server to install an agent? Um, that's the kind of space that, that uh, these folks are in. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I think that, that this sort of edging environment is, is one of those things that's that's coming fast to to computing because of the cloud because of the changing nature of, of, of our borders I mean you know we've seen that in the physical world we're seeing that in the networking world now I get more clients calling me and saying you know where where's where's the border you know it's it stopped it's now a, a much bigger thing and so the whole concept of, of edge computing I think is a very growing thing and you can see money coming into that field so I'm glad to see people that are developing solutions off into that realm all right you want to close this out because I'm done he's done so, okay, well, we've reached the edge of, 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 of wherever we were going, I think. Thank you so much for watching Matt and I on uh, Enterprise Security Weekly. Uh, we enjoyed it. We hope you did too, and we'll see you another time. <laughs>